Four years ago, I started a job as a junior AWS cloud engineer. I was attracted by all of the positive aspects of the role posted online. But although I still love my job, there are a few things that you have to be aware of. In this video, I'll go over a list of five things you need to accept before going into a cloud engineering career. And to start, we need to talk about the most frustrating challenge that every cloud engineer faces. One that could cause you to eventually leave the industry. Imagine being an air traffic controller at a small airport. At first, you're managing a handful of flights each day, carefully coordinating their movements. You've got your radar and your communication mm. channels. Everything runs smoothly. But then your airport expands and becomes an international hub. Instead of handling 20 flights daily, you're suddenly responsible for 200. The tools haven't changed. The staff hasn't increased, but the expectations have. Every decision you make now affects 10 times more planes and the stress really starts to increase. And this can be the reality for many cloud engineers, particularly those working on platform teams. This relative says that platform engineering is the new burnout hamster wheel. 40 teams need your tools now. Otherwise, business value isn't delivered, but the project just started and we don't have any requirements for any tools. For a cloud engineer, consider what could happen in a day in the life. A critical production system alerts at 3 a.m requiring immediate attention. By 9 a.m., there are meetings with development teams who need new features. By lunch, they're troubleshooting security vulnerabilities. And by afternoon, they're reviewing architectural changes for different teams, each believing their request is the most urgent. The technology itself never stops evolving either. Cloud engineers need to understand networking, security, development tools, automation, cost optimization, and others. I remember reading one particular engineer, describing it as feeding a Rube Goldberg machine that keeps growing new parts while you're trying to maintain the old ones. You might be thinking that companies can just hire more people to help deal with the workload. And certain companies do. They invest in new engineers and invest a lot into training them. But equally, some companies may prioritize efficiency. In this case, the workload and pressure can really be quite intense. This isn't necessarily anything unique to cloud engineering, but it's something that new people entering the career should definitely consider. Burnout is real and something you may need to prepare for. But aside from burnout, there's another challenge that pretty much all cloud engineers have to deal with, and this could make or break your career. But before we talk about this, if you're looking to improve your cloud skills in just five minutes a week, then subscribe to my email newsletter in the description below. Every week, I share simple, useful educational tips. So to understand this, let's talk about orchestra conductors. They bring together lots of musicians, each playing different instruments and blends them into one performance. They might not play any instruments themselves, but their understanding of musical theory and rhythm really makes the entire performance possible. But imagine if one day, Violin players started saying, conductors aren't real musicians, they just wave their arms around. A bit disrespectful, right? The truth is, this is sometimes what cloud engineers face. They juggle multiple responsibilities, ensuring network security, optimizing database performance, writing automation scripts, and infrastructure as code. Just like conductors, they need to understand different instruments in their digital orchestra, networking, security, Linux, and yes, software development too. But they can face dismissive attitudes from other developers or other roles in the business who view infrastructure work as just click ops. For example, this senior developer says that he sees it as software engineers wanting to appear super superior to other roles by limiting what other roles could do. Essentially, they wanted to state that only software engineers could work on building slash maintaining Python libraries and Docker images. And then SRE slash DevOps types roles were relegated to single file Python scripts and bash files. Recruiters don't help either. This engineer says that a recruiter asked him, can you really code? You know, really write a program? This misunderstanding isn't just about hurt feeling. It has real consequences. When infrastructure work is seen as secondary to application development, it can affect careers and salary levels. I'm not saying that it's like this in every company. Personally, I've been fortunate enough to not experience anything as bad as what the engineers on Reddit have described. But these kinds of perceptions do exist. The reality is cloud and infrastructure work can be misunderstood and therefore undervalued. Your technical expertise alone isn't enough. You have to be prepared to advocate for yourself and fight against these perceptions to make sure your skills are properly recognized. But there's another hidden factor that's driving some cloud engineers away from the job. So think about a professional chef. In a typical restaurant kitchen, chefs master their craft through years of repetition. They perfect their techniques, memorize recipes, and develop an intuitive understanding of their tools. Once they've reached a particular level, they know that their skills and knowledge will serve them well for many more years to come. They will still have to learn new things, but not at such a rapid rate. But imagine if every few weeks, someone completely redesigned their kitchen. The stove now works differently. The oven has new features that must be learned. And failing to master these changes immediately could negatively affect thousands of customers 
customers. Imagine that while you're still learning about the new stove, they've already announced three more kitchen upgrades coming next month. This is something that cloud engineers have to face. Cloud providers release new updates to their services very often. Most of the time, these are very small changes, but sometimes this could mean a whole service will be deprecated or a whole new service is added. And cloud engineers have to keep on top of all of this and make sure that their skills are staying up to date. The pressure isn't just about learning new things. It's about the depth and breadth of knowledge required. You know, one day you're diving deep into Terraform configurations, the next you're updating security protocols for GDPR compliance. The cloud industry is also not as mature as other established areas in technology, with decades of best practices and guidelines. What was considered best practice last year might change today. Cloud providers themselves regularly redefine terms and service names, making it hard to maintain a consistent vocabulary across different cloud platforms. There's also some pressure to specialize deeply in specific platforms like AWS or Azure. Companies are increasingly adopting hybrid approaches, which basically means using multiple cloud platforms. So engineers have to be flexible enough to work across different environments while still maintaining a specialist knowledge in their primary cloud platform. Personally, for me, I've quite enjoyed having to constantly learn new things. And for people at the beginning of their career, I do think there are some positives in this. You develop a lot faster as an engineer if you're exposed to more problems. But this pressure to stay on top of many things can be overwhelming and definitely something you should consider if you're considering getting into this role. But it's not just the pressure of having to constantly learn new things. There's also a lot of other pressures that sometimes you can't even control. So imagine being hired as the lead mechanic for a racing team. The team hired you because of your proven track record and experience. But there's a catch. These modern race cars contain sophisticated electronic control units and operating systems that are completely locked down by the manufacturer. You can access certain information on a dashboard, but the core systems, the very heart of the vehicle's performance, can only be accessed by the manufacturer. On race day, with millions watching, the car starts losing power, but the diagnostic system only displays a very generic error code. You think it could be a firmware issue, but you have no way to prove it or fix it. You can restart systems, check connections and attempt workarounds, but you can't actually address the root cause. You have the knowledge to fix the problem, but you don't have access to apply that knowledge. And this is similar to what cloud engineers sometimes have to go through. They're hired for their expertise in building, maintaining and optimizing cloud infrastructure. But under the hood, everything is managed and owned by the cloud providers. Cloud engineers operate kind of in this middle layer. They can touch the services built on top of the cloud, but they can't reach into the cloud provider's data centers, networks, or systems when things go wrong at that level. And this isn't really the problem in itself. The problem is that there's a lot of pressure from business people in the company. To them, the cloud is the cloud, and the cloud engineer is responsible for anything cloud-related. This kind of situation is particularly stressful during a major outage from a cloud provider. There's a lot of pressure on the cloud engineers to fix the problem, but most of the time, the best that we can do is provide updates from the cloud provider themselves. And sometimes this isn't even possible. One engineer says that in one case during an outage, the status page was hosted by Azure, and if Azure was down, the status page was down too. And I think it can get more stressful as time goes on. You start getting questions like, what's our plan to fix this? Or how long until it's resolved? Or what steps are you taking right now? The honest answer most of the time is, I have no idea when the provider will fix it, or I'm refreshing the status page just like everyone else. But this is obviously quite a bold statement to say and could risk your credibility in other people's eyes. So this kind of difference in expectations between what a cloud engineer can actually do and what they are expected to do is definitely something that is worth considering. As a cloud engineer, you could end up in a situation where you look incompetent during an outage, even though you've done everything you can. And this can be quite overwhelming. One engineer says, being semi on the hook for pretty much everything weighs heavily on the shoulders. So the the unrealistic expectations and stress coming from owning systems that you sometimes can't control is a factor you need to consider. But you know, with all this in mind, should you actually become a cloud engineer? I think it comes down to a few key factors. If you're someone that's, number one, comfortable with constantly learning new things, two, enjoys the unpredictability and unstructuredness of the job, and three, deals well in high pressure situations, then I think this would be a good choice for you. Throughout the video, it may seem like I'm trying to convince you not to be a cloud engineer, but this is wrong. I've been a cloud engineer for almost four years now, and I love it. I love the technical challenges, the different things that I get to learn, and the different areas of IT and technology that I get exposed to. Personally, for me, the positives definitely outweigh the negatives. And if you agree with me, and want to become a cloud engineer, then you need to learn the most important tool that every cloud engineer uses. So click here to find out what that is and how to learn it.